Good morning. Are we just days away from Russia invading Ukraine? That's what the Americans think. Things could go crazy quickly, as President Biden said this week. The UK is one of more than a dozen countries telling its nationals to leave immediately. Just days after the Prime Minister, the Foreign Secretary and the Defence Secretary flew to the region for a hectic round of diplomacy, is the time for talking now over or can this crisis be pulled back from the brink? With little sign this morning that attempts to persuade Russia to step back from an invasion are working, Cabinet Minister Brandon Lewis will be here to tell us why the government fears for the security of Europe. I've been asking Derek Cholet, the senior advisor to US Secretary of State Antony Blinken, how imminent the Americans think an attack is. I'll speak to Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper days after Britain's highest ranking police officer lost her job. Two, one, zero. And could this breakthrough in a UK laboratory herald a limitless source of clean energy? Reviewing the papers with me this morning, the host of Mastermind and BBC News presenter Clive Murray and the Financial Times political and diplomatic correspondent Laura Hughes. But first, the news with Nina Warhurst. Sophie, thank you. The Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, says it's highly likely that Vladimir Putin will order Russian forces to attack Ukraine. Mr Wallace told the Sunday Times there was a whiff of Munich in the air, a reference to the last days of diplomacy before the Second World War. The Kremlin has repeatedly denied any plans to invade. At least 13 people have been injured after a mezzanine floor collapsed at a pub in East London. Firefighters rescued seven people who became trapped after the incident at the Two More Years bar in Hackney Wick yesterday. Paramedics said three people were seriously hurt and ten more had minor injuries. Boris Johnson's newly appointed chief of staff has said that the government will take a step back from people's lives and it's now a priority to restore a smaller state. Writing in the Daily Telegraph, Steve Barclay said that it was time to return to a more enabling approach after nearly two years of government intervention because of the pandemic. And one of the hardest and best victories in a Welsh shirt. So says Dan Bigger as he leads the reigning champions to a much needed win over Scotland in the Six Nations. And that's all from me. The next news on BBC One is at one o'clock. Back to you, Sophie. Thank you very much. Now let's have a look at the front pages this morning and uh, dominated by the situation in uh, Ukraine. This has the whiff of Munich is the big headline on the Sunday Times and it's uh, an interview that Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, has given to the newspaper where he likens desperate Western efforts to prevent Russian invasion of Ukraine to appeasement. The Sunday Telegraph again leading with uh, the situation in Russia and Ukraine. Russia plots a false flag attack, they're saying, to provoke war. We'll be talking more about that and also an image on the front there of uh, Ukrainians yesterday marching through Kiev um, in a unity march. The Observer as well, they've got uh, President Biden there after that phone call that he had with President Putin yesterday, more than an hour on the phone. You'll pay a heavy cost if you attack Ukraine, is what uh, President Biden told Russian President. The Mail, very different lead this morning, Charles and Camilla to be crowned side by side. And they have a lot of details of what is apparently known, the codename Operation Golden Orb. The Express, they have an interview there with uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Coming soon, they say Brexit's big wins for Britain. And on the mirror, Belfield, a confession was a sick joke. This is a source claiming that uh, a letter about the Russell killings was a wind-up. And the son, uh, Premier Prem Ace, arrested over attack on Lover. Well, let's talk in more detail with my guests this morning. Clive Murray is here and Laura Hughes from the Financial Times joins us as well. Good morning to both of you. Laura, let's start with you um, and the interview that's in the Sunday Times this morning with the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, a whiff of Munich, he says. It's a really striking comment from the Defence Secretary this morning. I think it's the sort of 
biggest headline out there across all the papers. And it's interesting to note as well, when you read that article, I think there is also a whiff of frustration at the French in particular, which is alluded to there, the idea that some Western allies have been trying to talk with Putin have been a little bit more soft in their approach, whereas the UK and the US are taking a slightly firmer line. And that quote so significant because it suggests that although we've seen this diplomatic blitz, we've seen leaders across Europe trying to reach out to Putin, trying to talk to him, it may come to no avail. And it's an interesting question as to why the Russians have been engaging with the West in the way that they have. But Clearly, too, there is a real desire from the likes of Ben Wallace and the UK government to show the Americans that we are still their number one ally in Europe, to stay very closely aligned to them. But also, I think there is a fear that Putin saw what happened in Afghanistan, believes that there's no real Western interest in military or um, overseas involvement. And this is the West, the UK, the US trying to show, no, this is not Kabul take two. We are serious and we are prepared to take very, very serious sanctions and potentially military action if you do make any further incursions into Ukraine. And Clive, lots and lots of coverage, of course, of this in the papers. The Sun has this double bra uh, page mm. spread here, 48 hours to war. It, it really does feel imminent. It does and it doesn't. I mean, what the West, what America, the British, Ben Wallace, what they're all saying is that Putin has now got his assets in place. If he wants to attack, everything is in place now. He's got heavy artillery, he's got the troops, he's got uh, combat air as well. So if he wants to do it, he can do it. But we don't know if he's made up his mind whether or not he's going to do that yet. Um, and that the uh, sort of headline there in the, in the sun, 48 hours to war, um, we simply have no idea. Uh, and the West has no idea if Putin has made up his mind. Um, so while we've got to be, I think, a little bit careful about the fact that Ben Wallace is talking about Munich and, and, and uh, the papers are talking about it being imminent, um, the people in Ukraine itself, they are really quite sanguine about the whole situation, given the coverage that I've certainly seen our correspondents put out over the last few days. And there's a story in the mail there uh, from Ian Birrell, who's in, uh, in uh, Kiev. Um, and it's about Brits who are going to stay. Um, this is a story of, of, I think he's a teacher, and he's married a Russian woman. And um, he's staying, he wants to be with his Ukrainian friends. There are others who've decided they're not going to leave as well. And I think we've got to sort of balance the suggestion that there will be war, simply because the troops are on the border, with whether or not that's actually going to happen. And as far as the people in Ukraine are concerned, at the moment, they're still fairly sanguine with the situation. And Laura, let's talk about uh, Liz Truss. There are quite a few, uh, there's a profile of her today in The Observer, your, the Financial Times, who you work for, there was a big profile about her in that. She's obviously been photographed, she was in Moscow this week. Uh, tell us more about that. Well, yes, those pictures are slightly provocative to a lot of people who feel as though she's desperately trying to look like Margaret Thatcher did, and that these pictures are all very deliberate. She looks very stateswoman-like, and this is all a sort of grand scheme um, if there is a leadership contest to show her as a global figure and someone standing up, you know, the Iron Lady standing up to the Russians. I think if you speak to allies around her, they would argue that Liz Truss is a communicator and that images and Instagram, as we know she's very, very uh, capable on, are just the modern way of communicating with the voters in the Conservative Party. But the Observer suggests this morning there are some ministers whose feathers have been a little ruffled at how many pictures have been taken of her by taxpayer-funded photographers on these state trips. Those around her, of course, very defensive about that and saying she's just doing her job and she's telling us all how, how well she's doing it. Uh, and there's a piece we're looking at here in The Observer which says five photos a day help Liz Truss to secure endless great exposure. And all this obviously comes at a time. It's, it's gone fairly quiet. The investigation into the parties in Downing Street, we know that the questionnaires have gone out. But there's the Liz Truss profiles and also the Rishi Sunak as well, the, the piece by him today. You do feel that these are sort of slightly jostling behind the scenes? Oh, 100%. But, you know, Liz Truss has been using Instagram in her own unique way for a very long time. And she was in the Department for International Trade. The civil servants used to joke it was the Department for Instagramming Trust. She's she's always used photography in, in, in this sort of 
quite clever to some people um, way and there are lots of others who I think are probably a little bit jealous but at the same time some have felt it's a little distasteful there was a, a picture of her on a, on a motorbike abroad when Richard Ratcliffe was protesting outside the Foreign Office about his wife who's still being detained in Iran you know you, you've got to get the, the tone right and and this is obviously a, a diplomatic crisis people warning about war not everyone wants to see a picture of, of Liz Truss in a fluffy hat but you know, it, it's actually played very well with the Tory voters, and I think people around her will continue to encourage her to do what she does. Clive, let's talk about a very different story. This is the front page of the Mail on Sunday today, and this is Operation Golden Orb. Yes, now that is the code name. It says here, secret code name, no longer secret, um, for uh, Prince Charles's uh, Westminster Abbey coronation plans. Lots of detail about what will be involved, the idea that it's going to be stripped right back compared to the 1953 coronation of the Queen. Uh, and perhaps more in keeping with, with the austerity of, of, of modern times and uh, the suggestion as well that um, uh, despite scaling things back, fewer people in attendance in uh, Westminster Abbey. In 53, I think there were 8,000 people. This time the suggestion is it's going to be 2,000 people. He's still going to be travelling in the golden coach there, which is uh, terribly <laughs> uncomfortable. But I think what's important to remember is that the... Ab the, the the palace is not going to talk openly about preparations for uh, uh, the, the Prince Charles being crowned king. It is unseemly. Um, we still have a monarch on the throne. Yet the Queen made mention the, of Queen exactly. Camilla on so the very day now she was celebrating now you years. are Exactly. Now you are beginning to get more conversations about what a coronation would look like because the Queen herself has broached it in talking about the fact that she believes that Camilla should be uh, crowned queen consort. And as a result, we are probably going to get more discussion about this uh, as time passes. But it's interesting that this is now out in the public domain, um, given the Queen's comments last night. I love night. the detail about the golden coach. That, uh, it says that he will still use. The Queen once described her bone-rattling journey on her 1953 coronation when she was 26 as horrible. And, uh, and it, the Queen wore the crown as well, which is incredibly, incredibly heavy. heavy. There have been monarchs in the past who refused to wear it during the coronation because it's just too heavy. Laura, let's talk about uh, Dame Cressida Dick and uh, the, the aftermath of that. Up is covered in great detail in the papers today. We've got Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. We hear from him as well as the Home Secretary, Priti Patel. Yeah, Sadiq Khan has quite a personal piece in The Observer where he talks about his own father telling him not to look policemen or women in the eye when he was a child because they didn't want to get in the wrong way. And I think back then there was a feeling that there was some institutional racism going on. And Sadiq Khan writes about that in the context of today. He's saying there is clearly a, a cultural problem, a really huge really huge crisis facing the Metropolitan Police, a, a litany of mistakes that have been made that clearly led him to feel he no longer had the confidence in Cressida Dick and that led to her ultimately resigning, being forced to go. And then the Mail on Sunday has a piece where friends and allies of Priti Patel are quoted as saying that she too is concerned about a cultural problem. There's a reference to the BBC series Line of Duty. She says to friends apparently that you know she's been concerned when she's chatted to police officers they all seem to know each other they all seem to have been in the force for a very long time and it's way too clubby and something really has to change they're clearly now on the hunt to find a replacement at a really sticky political time for a new head of the met and Sadiq khan warning he will not approve anyone who he does not feel understands the challenge and has a plan to really do a proper reform of Metropolitan and Police. It's interesting this, isn't it? You've got the Labour Mayor of London, you've got the Home Secretary. I mean, is there a danger because the, the Home Secretary appoints the new head of the Met, but the, the head of the, the Labour Mayor has to get on with him or her and has to approve them as well. Is there a danger that politics is now going to come into play in the appointment of whoever comes next? I think it's going to be really difficult. Priti Patel and Sadiq Khan are probably not the most natural allies in the world but I think there is some unity this morning in, in both these pieces that they appreciate the need for reform but of course Sadiq Khan moved a lot quicker than Priti Patel who was prepared to let Cressida Dick stay in post for another two years because she didn't feel there was a suitable replacement out there at the moment that plan has clearly been chucked out and she's got to move very very fast 
I think it will be quite political, especially given the party gate row going on around the prime minister. It's a really hard appointment to make and, and who out there is really going to want Absolutely. to take this on as well. <laughs> Um, and Clive here, there's a, a story in The Observer. Can the mm. Met change is the big question they're posing there. Yeah, it's a really good piece, this, because it talks to um, uh, former senior officials uh, in various police forces and commentators about what the Met needs to do in order to um, properly uh, uh, police our streets and have confidence, frankly, from the public and the citizens that it's supposed to serve. And it's interesting, looking at all the different comments, most of them begin with, the Met has to understand it has a problem. And in my own experience, uh, in dealing with senior officers, not just in the Met, actually, but across the country, um, there seems to be an unwillingness to appreciate just how deep-rooted the problems within culture, within their forces, is and how much of a problem it is. And I think understanding that there's a problem is the beginning of being able mm. to tackle the problem. And I think we've reached the point now with the Met where the force itself now understands it has something that it's got to do. Mm. Uh, Clive, before we finish, here you are, you're dressed down Sunday look. <laughs> Normally I see you in a suit and tie, you're doing yes. movies with me. Yes. Um, but uh, mastermind, celebrity mastermind. Celebrity mastermind. mastermind. They won't let you dress like that though. We're on no, a, yeah, I do it. no, <laughs> no. I was one of the first things I said to the controllers <laughs> of the BBC that I will be turning up to present mastermind dressed like this. And it was a stony silence. Oh, right. That suit I was and tie with. though. Anyway, you're doing it so very clear. well. Very well. And the celebrity series is on now. It is on now, yes. Yes, uh, we had our second uh, show uh, last night, um, and of course it's available on iPlayer, folks, um, on Saturdays on uh, BBC One. And, uh, you know, we've got stars from Strictly, Jeanette Manrara, we've got um, uh, Anna Soubry, for instance, you know, Camilla Tomini, who sat on this very seat herself, and the comedians like Nish Kumar um, and Rufus Hound, and subjects ranging from the history of ice cream to the history of women riding bicycles. <laughs> I mean, the songs of Kylie Minogue, you name it, it's all there. It's a smorgasbord of entertainment, it's fun, and the celebrities appearing for their favourite charities. So, Sophie, the sofa will, the black chair, We've had this will always be it, there it the for you. Never. Laura, I can see... <laughs> I know you want to come on. I know it. <laughs> It's just the no. fear. It's the fear of freezing <laughs> under the lights, I it, think. It, That's it. it. You asked the most it, obvious it question. Scary. It is absolutely scary. And that chair has magical powers. It does render people <laughs> who sit in it mute on occasion. I can imagine. That's there exactly why I'm not coming on. Clive Murray, <laughs> lovely to see you. Laura Hughes, thank you so much for joining us for a look at the papers this morning. Let's have a look at the weather now. Matt Taylor. Thank you very much, Sophie. Well, I think my specialist subject will be soggy roads and pavements of the UK, not just today, but throughout the week. This is the scene a short while ago in Northern Ireland. This is how it looks like on our radar chart. The extent of the blue shows how extensive the rain is over the past few hours. Northern Ireland now into southern Scotland, where it'll sit all day long, particularly wet in some of the hills of uh, South, South Wales and South West England, where we're going to see the strongest of the wind, strong to gale force. It's dry at the moment, East Anglia, the South East. The rain will be here into the afternoon, driest of all throughout the far north of Scotland with a bit of brightness, lightest of the winds, but it may ease off a bit across some western areas later and overall for the stage in February, still a rather mild day. It's this evening and overnight, so rain keeps going across East Anglia, South East, turns drier elsewhere for a time, but there will still be a scattering of showers around. The winds switch into the north, so a colder start to tomorrow morning. Could be some frost and ice across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland, but here some brighter weather, not a bad day for southern Scotland and later into northern England. Uh, scattering wintry showers though in northern Scotland throughout the day and in northern Ireland, but showers easing off in the west. Lots of cloud for England and Wales. Rain will come and go nowhere near as extensive as today, but it will feel chillier as the day goes on. Some milder air comes our way midweek, but Sophie, all in all, I've had a wet and windy week in store. Back to oh, you. Oh, not very nice, Matt. Thank you. Things could go crazy quickly was how US President Joe Biden described the situation in Ukraine. And that was before the Americans warned Russia could begin missile attacks within days. Well, our diplomatic correspondent James Landell is here to explain how we reached that point. Over the last three months, there have been fears in the West that Russia was planning to invade Ukraine. It all began last November when satellite images began showing Russian troop movements uh, close to the border with Ukraine. Now, President Putin denied planning an invasion, but he has written publicly about, about how he sees Russians and Ukrainians as one people. He also wants to block Ukraine from ever joining NATO. 
Now, this led Western powers to bolster NATO's eastern flank here and threaten severe economic sanctions against Russia if it invaded. And there the matter largely stayed. But there have been suggestions in recent days that the crisis is coming to a head. Here's the Prime Minister. This is probably the most dangerous moment, uh, I would say, in the, in the course of the next few days, in what is the uh, biggest security crisis that uh, Europe has faced for, for decades. So why is he saying that? Well, primarily because Russian troop numbers have continued to rise. For some time, it was estimated there were about 100,000 troops around Ukraine's borders. With newer units arriving now, that estimate has risen to 130,000. Russia has also been moving thousands of troops into Belarus here to the north for what it says are military exercises. Exercises taking place just a few hundred miles from the capital city of Ukraine, Kiev. The US also says it has intelligence suggesting military action is likely, including the way Russia is configuring its forces and planning false pretexts for invasion. The truth is that no one really knows what Vladimir Putin intends. But on Friday, the White House issued a stark warning. We are in the window when an invasion could begin at any time, should Vladimir Putin decide to order it. The bottom line is that the reason some Western policymakers believe the crisis is coming to a head is not because Russia is failing to de-escalate, is because it's actually escalating a crisis, all the while diplomacy is failing to bear much fruit. So, James, is an invasion now looking inevitable? Well, the only person who really knows the answer to that question is Vladimir Putin. Certainly, the US intelligence is very pessimistic. You know, they think invasion is very possible. They think there's plans for it to happen. Uh, but nobody at the moment is saying it's inevitable. I point to a couple of things. One is, one of the reasons why the US is being so open about its assessment is to actually get it all out there to almost deter an attack by calling out President Putin and saying, look, we know what you're doing, so that if there is any false pretext for a conflict, you know, the US have anticipated it. The other thing to say is there's a lot of diplomacy going on, lots of calls between world leaders yesterday, more to come. The new German chancellor is going to Moscow on Tuesday, and they've got a lot to talk about. There's this thing called the Minsk Agreements, which were the unsuccessful deals signed back in 2014 and 15 to try and get a ceasefire and a political settlement in eastern Ukraine. Now, they failed. The fighting continues. But there's a hope maybe that's a route out. It's disputed. It's convoluted. Some people fear this could be a way of blocking Ukraine ever becoming a member of NATO by giving those enclaves, those pro-Russian enclaves, too much of a say in foreign policy. That might be the source of the, uh, the, the comments from Ben Wallace saying there's a, a sense mm. of Munich. But others say, look, it might be a route out, so let's at least talk about it. One little note of optimism. If you looked at social media in Ukraine yesterday, all the talk was not about invasion, but actually their contender for the new Eurovision Song Contest. So there's, as Clive was saying, there's still that gap between mm. perception and there and the, the threats and the dire warnings from elsewhere. James Landau, thank you. Well, it is the Americans who've been really sounding the alarm in the past few days. They were the first to tell their citizens to leave Ukraine. I've been speaking to Derek Cholet, the senior advisor to the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. And I asked him what President Biden had said to Vladimir Putin in their phone call yesterday. President Biden made very clear to Putin that he has a choice to make. And there are two very clear paths. One is the path of diplomacy and dialogue, which he reiterated to President Putin, the United States is prepared to take. And President Biden made clear that he and Secretary Blinken and others in the administration are willing to talk to the Russians about areas where they have concerns, uh, although not moving off what is our bottom line, uh, that NATO's open door must remain open, and that we will not be seeking to unwind the last quarter century of work to strengthen European security, uh, as Putin seems to wish uh, we would do. Uh, but secondly, President Biden made very clear to President Putin that if he chooses the path of escalation and confrontation, there will be swift and severe consequences. And what does he mean by that, imposing swift and severe consequences? Well, as, as a first order, the sanction, the economic sanctions uh, that, that the Russian Federation would suffer under would be quite considerable. And the United States and our European partners, the UK and the EU and others, have been working on a series of sanctions uh, that would be crippling to the Russian economy uh, when imposed. Uh, also, President Biden made very clear to President Putin 
that we would continue to bolster and build military capacity along NATO's eastern flank from north to south, from the Balts in Poland down to Romania uh, and Bulgaria, to reinforce our Article 5 commitment. So it seems to us that, that this would be a, a Russian military action on Ukraine would be a major strategic setback for Russia. It would leave Russia isolated in the world. It would bring tremendous tr economic hardship upon the Russians as a result of the sanctions. And it would further divide Russia from Europe, and it would strengthen NATO. So all things that, that President Putin would not want. Has President Putin already decided to invade? We don't know if he has made that decision. However, the administration, our U.S. administration, has made clear in the last several days that we believe that they are within the window of operating and that a military incursion could come at any day. President Biden warned that things could go crazy quickly. What does he mean by that? Well, I think any major Russian military action in Ukraine will bring tremendous, tremendous hardship. I think we will see a lot of suffering and casualties. Uh, moreover, we are concerned about uh, internally displaced within Ukraine, as well as refugees crossing the border, leaving Ukraine. And we have been talking to our partners on Ukrainian, Ukraine's border about that. I was in Romania last just a few days ago talking to uh, Romanian officials about those contingencies. Uh, and moreover, war often uh, goes in directions that one cannot predict. And, th and that's why the United States is making very clear to Russia uh, that uh, any threat to uh, any NATO member would bring about the Article 5 uh, commitment of mutual self-defense. And that's why the United States, the United Kingdom, other NATO partners are deploying forces along NATO's eastern flank from north to south. So to be clear, this is not about the West talking up the risks to deter President Putin from invading. Well, of course, we hope he does not invade, but we see that the threats are so severe and the, and the consequences would be so profound that prudence dictates that we take these steps to uh, warn the public, uh, warn the Ukrainians, and also take prudent steps to protect ourselves within Ukraine by uh, reducing the, the size of our embassy to ensure that if, if conflict does come, uh, our diplomats are, are out of harm's way. The White House has said that an invasion could take a number of different forms. Beyond troops crossing the border, what could an invasion look like? The National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan uh, briefed the, uh, a few days ago saying that it could be significant airstrikes, uh, obviously a ground incursion. Uh, whatever form it takes, if it is as large as we fear it will be, uh, the consequences will be profound for Ukraine and, and quite dangerous. We are providing material support to the Ukrainian military, in addition to the, the training that we're providing the mili Ukrainian military. Uh, the Ukrainian military is in a far different place than it was eight years ago in terms of its capabilities. It is more modern and capable. And that support will continue in the event of, of a Russian invasion. President Biden has said that to have Americans and Russians ever shooting at one another, that could lead to a world war. Do you think that these events could spark another world war? What we're worried about right now is Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine, its further invasion into Ukraine and the consequences of that. Uh, war can take an unpredictable path. And, and we think whatever, if Russia does act in the way that we fear it will, it will bring tremendous hardship and greater insecurity uh, into the heart of Europe. And, and that is a concern to all of us. Uh, it's a concern, concern to the United States as a NATO ally. It's a concern to the countries that border Ukraine. Uh, the economic, the political, and the security costs will be profound. Councillor Scholle, thank you very much for talking to us. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Keir Starmer says under his leadership, the Labour Party's commitment to NATO, the military alliance, which includes the US, the UK, France and Germany, is unshakable. This week, he visited NATO headquarters for a briefing about the threat posed by Russia. And in doing so, he drew a contrast, a stark contrast with his predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn. Well, I'm joined now by the shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper. Thank you very much for coming Good this morning. Good morning. Good morning. How serious a threat do you think it is, first of all, that if Russia does invade Ukraine, that it could spill over into a much bigger conflict? 
I think that is exactly why we need a very strong and united response, international response, to this Russian belligerence. It is immensely serious and nobody should be naive about what Russia is up to and the scale of the troops amassing on the Ukraine border. And that's why I think there has to be this extremely strong and swift and severe economic sanctions, financial sanctions, looking at the energy sector. There has to be a very clear response. And it's why why we've been also very strong about supporting the government on this, supporting the UK government's position, but also for that international uh, united response too. Sanctions aside, though, I mean, the, the UK government has ruled out putting in any British troops into Ukraine to protect it. Would, would Labour also rule it out sending any troops? I think we would agree with the government's position on this. And as you'll uh, be aware, our Labour Shadow Foreign Secretary, David Lammy, our Labour Shadow Defence Secretary, John Healy, have been to the Ukraine, given the seriousness of this, to talk to people there about the support that they're calling for. It's why the government, I think, was right to provide that training support and to provide equipment but equally to say that uh, we have a, a different response for those that are on NATO countries as well. But there should be no doubt for Russia about this, about the strength of the not just the UK response, the international united response that there needs to be on the economic pressure, the financial pressure that there needs to be on Russia in response to any kind of incursion or invasion. We have to take this immensely seriously. And as, as you say, Britain has, has um, provided military armament and troops to train, but they have now been taken out. Is the message to uh, the Ukrainians this morning, if Russia comes in, if Russia does attack, militarily, you're now on your own. I think the economic, we should not underestimate the importance of the kind of economic and financial sanctions that could be imposed. And we haven't done that scale of response previously. There have been times in the past where we've called on the government, for example, to go further uh, on some of those um, responses and some of those financial responses and so on. I think at this point there has to be that united response uh, in a way that puts immense pressure on, on Putin, on his government and, uh, and on the Russian economy because that's the seriousness and the nature of this. But these troops have been building up for months now and the West has been threatening severe sanctions and and consequences for Russia, but there are even more troops now, more than 130,000 now on the border. It doesn't seem to be deterring President Putin. And that's the nature of the, the Putin response. That is, the I think, the, the difficulty about the, the level of belligerence that he has shown. But I think if he thinks that this will be a sufficient distraction from his domestic problems, he's underestimating, I think, the... The, the difficulties, the, uh, the, the human, human consequences that are likely to happen within the Ukraine, but also the economic consequences for Russia as well of the, the united international response that we need to see. Under Tony Blair, Labour had a, an interventionist foreign policy. Has that now changed under Keir Starmer? Well, I think we're supporting the, the NATO, we're supporting NATO, and actually that's always been our, our policy, uh, even though we may have had different uh, leader views in the past, we've always had a policy of supporting NATO and supporting the right kind of response. But in this scenario, do not get involved, do not inter intervene, no matter what is happening to people there. I think that's underestimating that actually the kind of economic response that we need is a, is a clear response. We're not saying we should step back and do nothing. We are saying that we should provide the kind of training support that Ukraine needs and also the kind of equipment that Ukraine needs and also be ready to provide the sort of clear economic sanctions. So I think the, the government, we've said we would support the government on this um, and I think that is the right approach to do so. And if Russia does start threatening NATO countries, if Russia did go into Ukraine and then the threat was to spill over into other NATO countries. Should British troops be ready to fight at that point? I don't think that is what Putin will do at this stage, but I think that actually it's because of the risks of that that we need this international united response. But clearly, look, we recognise our obligations under NATO, just as I'm sure that the government will as well, and we would expect to work with the government on that. But it's because of the risks of something much wider that we have to have this very clear, strong international response and this strong economic response to any kind of Russian incursion. And nobody should be kind of 
don't underestimate really the, the seriousness of this and that's why we've also called for the government to go further on some of the financial sanctions we called repeatedly there's some of the measures that were set out in the Russia report some time ago we do need accelerated response on some of those issues we need an accelerated response on things like the um, Russian uh, the visas the so-called golden visas the tier one visas that there's been no response from the Home Office on so there's a whole series of other areas around financial responses that we believe the government should go further I hope they will be and we will be supporting them in doing so your, as well your predecessor Diana but has said this week that Keir Starmer positions himself as a pro-war Labour leader obviously he would have taken us into the Iraq war but in another era he would presumably have flung British troops into Vietnam what do you say to her I don't think that's right. I don't. I think this, this is um, a, a sort of talking in terms of caricatures. I have said in the past we did the wrong thing on Iraq. There weren't weapons of mass destruction. But I also think that in the past there was the right response in terms of Bosnia and the serious issues that, that there were there. In any kind of international situation, you have to take a very serious and thoughtful response. It has to be relevant to that particular conflict, to that particular issue, to that particular threat and it has to be very serious but what Keir Starmer has made very clear is our national security will always be a priority for Labour uh, and that is really important and right that he should do so. So Diana Abbott was wrong in what she said? I, I don't think I, I've had dif I have differences different a, a view okay. from from Diane from things. Are you welcome in the Labour Party if you do not support NATO? Um, I think that is how been our policy always. It has always been at the 2019 election. It was our policy to support NATO. Let's move on to Dame Cressida mm. Dick, who has uh, left her job, lost her job very dramatically, very suddenly this uh, week. Britain's most senior police officer. Was the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, right to force her to stand down? I think the mayor was right to insist that there needs to be reforms to the Metropolitan Police. That report into Charing Cross, uh, the unit at Charing Cross, I think was just truly shocking. He also has to be able to have confidence in the Metropolitan Police Commissioner to deliver those reforms. Once that confidence was lost, then the Met, uh, the Met Commissioner was right to resign and I support the mayor's decision. But what I am concerned about in all of this debate is it's all focusing on one individual, one individual new appointment, and also one police force. I think the challenges for policing are much broader than this, and there needs to be Home Office-led reforms in this area as well. When Sarah Everard was murdered uh, by, she was murdered by a serving police officer, the Metropolitan Police were found to be institutionally corrupt, and police officers took pictures of murder, murdered women. At that moment, the Mayor of London did not withdraw his support from Dame Cressida Dick. So, why did he choose this week to force her out? I think we've seen the scale of issues with the Charing Cross inquiry and we need to see reforms. But it's really worth stressing this. This is not about just one individual solving this or one police force. You've seen similar issues around Leicestershire, Sussex, uh, Police Scotland, other forces as well. There is a real perfect storm facing policing right now, and it is a serious one. You have a situation where crime is going up, prosecutions are going down, confidence is falling. There's a legacy of damaging cuts and also these individual toxic cases around the culture. There needs to be a proper serious programme of reform for policing. I strongly believe in the British policing model, policing by consent. I think that's something we should be proud of. But that means we also have to defend it, stand up for it, and also deliver reforms that will achieve it. At the moment, there's been none of those reforms from the Home Secretary. The Home Secretary has been silent on policing for a year. We have not seen any of the kinds of reforms to policing that we need, and Labour has set out a plan that would do that, including reforms to training, including reforms to vetting, including reforms to misconduct, and including at their heart making sure that violence against women and girls is part of the strategic policing requirement given to police forces across the country by the Home Office so that you challenge any in internal culture issues but also the policing of the country to make sure that women and girls can be kept safe which currently sure. too many feel that they're not. Can I ask you one question about uh, the Labour MP Rosie Duffield? She's the MP for Canterbury, she's been there since 2017. She says that she is thinking of quitting Labour um, over the abuse that she's had after voicing views on, on trans and gender. How does that make you feel, that she's thinking of leaving the party because she doesn't feel she has enough support? 
I've spoken to Rosie about um, some of the issues that she's faced and she's also had, I think, some uh, abuse in her local area as well from um, members of her local party as well that I think is totally unacceptable as well. The, it's really important that we ensure that uh, MPs, not just MPs, but actually everybody is free from abuse and free from jets. So and why I would is the Labour leader, support. Keir Starmer, not giving her more support? That's I would, what she says. Well, I, would, I think um, there's been a, a very strong sense among... Um, women MPs that we want to support Rosie and to make sure that there is no kind of abuse or intimidation against anybody so in the Labour Party. Will you ask Keir Starmer to do more? I think it's right that all of us should make sure that there's no abuse in the party and I think Keir has made that very clear that there should never be any kind of, uh, of abuse at all against people. Yvette Cooper, thank you very much. Now, this week we learned that something truly remarkable has happened in a laboratory in Oxfordshire, something that could have huge implications for future generations. That was the sight and sound of what is called nucle nuclear fusion. It's the energy process that powers the stars. And after decades of work, scientists are finally managing to recreate it here on Earth. This experiment was record-breaking, even though it lasts just five seconds and only produced enough energy to boil 60 kettles of water. But scientists hope it could one day lead to an unlimited, steady source of clean power. I've been talking to the experimental physicist Fernanda Rimini, who worked on the breakthrough. I asked her where she was when this record-breaking moment happened. I was in the control room. I was actually one of the people running the machine on, the, on, on that day. And because of COVID, um, there were only about 10, 12 of us in the control room. Everybody else from all over Europe was behind the Zoom, a huge sc Zoom screen with all this little tiles and people looking up to. Um, when, the, when it actually happened, what was your reaction? Did you all sort of jump up and celebrate? We, I don't think I, I don't, I don't remember. It's a little bit of a fuss. Um, I don't think we jumped up and, and celebrated, but we knew um, it was a record. We had done a few tests the, in the morning, so every, every test was more successful than the previous one. Every test beat the previous record. So we knew we were on the right route, and, and so it, it was good. We didn't jump up and down. Uh, we have to maintain a distance of two meters, so we didn't hug. But no, it was good. It was a feeling that, yeah, we've done it. And the, the importance of this is this is something you have worked towards for decades, isn't it? Uh, and let's have a look at it again, this, the moment. Talk us through what we're actually seeing. So what you're seeing is the inside of the machine, the experiment machine, and we put in some gas and then we heat it up to hun about 150 million degrees. 150 million, million degrees. degrees. Extraordinary. And at some point, uh, during the, uh, at some point, when it's really, really hot, it starts doing fusion and it starts producing energy. So for the, 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 this pulse itself is about 20 seconds long. And for five seconds of that, this was the record. This was the highest energy ever produced on, uh, in fusion on Earth, because this is what happens in the sun. But this is producing it on Earth because and the, controlling it. The last time, in 1997, it was just one second, wasn't it? And that's how long it's taken to, to get so the, to that level. The 1997 was one second transient fairly high, and then five seconds, about half, less than half of what we've produced now. And that amount of energy would really not power very much at the moment. 60 kettles is what we were yeah, told. Yeah, you, you say 60 kettles. I think I like to see it in a different way because it's difficult because jet, jet is an experiment, so it doesn't produce electricity. So for me, it's difficult to say this is electricity. But I can give you a, probably a more relevant um, comparison by saying that we used to produce the 59 megajoules of energy, we used about a fifth of a milligram of fuel. To produce the same amount of energy with coal, you would use kilograms, one or two kilograms or something of that sort. So this, this is the scale of what, is, of what we've done. Quite extraordinary. And the vision for the future is what? The vision for the future is a, is a power plant. So what a 
power plant that produces like the sort of base load of electricity production instead of coal, gas, um, oil, power plants. And it's green, it's clean, it doesn't have, it doesn't produce greenhouse, uh, sort of greenhouse gases. And it's something that could really replace the big power plants that we have now. Because also it's, it's hydrogen, isn't it? So it's, it's readily available. One part of the, it's, it's a fusion between two components. One is readily available, the deuterium is readily available in, in water, you can find it in water. The other one is tritium, is a little bit more difficult, but the, the idea is to breed it within the power plant itself. So it's green, it, it's clean. I mean, does this, it's a long way off still, isn't it? It is still quite a way off. Um, but does it give you hope for, for the future, really? Does it make you more optimistic for the future of the planet? It does. And it does make me hopeful that um, one of the things that I've seen for this, in the comments on this, uh, on this, um, on this record, um, because I live too much on Twitter, is that somebody said, oh, these are the boffins and they've done this thing in a test tube or they've done this, uh, they've done this experiment and now it will be up to the engineers to, to, make, to put it in practice. And no, fusion is one of those fields where we, the engineers and the physicists have always worked together. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. And what we have demonstrated here is not just that we understand the physics, but we validated some of the choices, some of the engineering choices for a, for a reactor for the next experimental device which has been built, ITER, been built in the south of France. So we've really validated, this is, this is really a big step forward, not just in physics, but also in engineering. And it does bring us more confidence that when we say the reactor will work, it will really work. How amazing. Well, what an extraordinary thing you did this, this week in Oxfordshire, the laboratory in Oxfordshire. Fernanda Rimini, thank you so much. Thanks. Quite an achievement. Well, let's go back now to the situation in Ukraine. Warnings of a Russian invasion are growing louder and louder. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, said it could be one of the worst crises on our European continent in decades. I'm joined now by the Cabinet Minister, Northern Ireland Secretary, Brandon Lewis. Good morning. One of the worst crises in Europe in decades, that's what it could be, says Boris Johnson. But no matter how bad things get, one thing Ukraine has to understand today is that they will not be getting any help from us, from America, militarily. Oh, well, we won't have troops, but they are getting support. Obviously, we've had the training going on since 2015. Thousands of Ukrainian troops have had that support from us. And obviously, we've given them some uh, defensive uh, weapons expertise as well. But there won't be troops on the ground from the UK forces, no. The Defence Secretary has given an interview this morning, um, Ben Wallace, and he says there is a whiff of Munich in the air from some in the West. What does he mean? Well, what he means is if, if you look back to that period of time, there was a lot of diplomatic engagement. There was a, uh, an optimism at the time, actually, that uh, there may be a diplomatic way through that it eventually proved to not be the case. 1938, exactly, a year yeah. before World War II. <clears throat> exactly. It turned out that wasn't the intent or the, the aim of, the, of, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of Adolf Hitler at the time. And then what he's drawing the comparison is, look, we hope... Uh, that the conversations that he has had, the Foreign Secretary and others, <clears throat> international engagement, the diplomacy this week, has a positive outcome and the Russia does work through and find a, a diplomatic, peaceful way out of this. But I think he's expressing that concern that we've got to be also un understanding the reality that while they're having these diplomatic conversations, Russia has continued to move troops. We've got now over 100 or about 130,000 troops on the borders, and therefore we've got to be cognizant of the reality that they could move very quickly. But who is Ben Wallace actually talking about? Which countries is he talking about? It's, it's, you know, 1938, it was a failed attempt to appease Hitler. Who's he talking about in terms of appeasing? Well, he's not talking about appeasing. I think the comparison that Ben was drawing, and I know the comparison he was drawing, was around the attempts for a diplomatic outcome that it turned out our adversaries at so the time weren't really interested in. And what he's hoping... And, and the is, is he directing this at France, at Germany? No, no, he no, no, no. At? The point that Ben is making is that we're all working on this to find the diplomatic outcome. That's the right outcome uh, about this situation with Ukraine. But he's expressing the fear that Russia may not be as genuine around that diplomatic outcome and the diplomatic engagement as we hope they are. But he's also said he hopes they do mean what they said to him, which is that they're not seeking to, to engage and to invade Ukraine. But when they are then continuing to put troops, and we see now, as I say, around 130,000 troops on that border, we have to be cognizant of the threat that that creates. 
Do you think this could be a moment that when we look back, like Munich, very famous moment in history, could it be a moment that we look back and regret not sending troops in to defend Ukraine? Our focus is absolutely and entirely on finding a diplomatic outcome. I think that is the right way to go. Ukraine is not part of NATO. Obviously, we want to keep that, as Derek Chalet said on, on, on this show just a few moments ago, that open door in terms of NATO policy. But this is a different situation to, to a country that would be a member of Ukraine. We're putting the support in. We've been very clear with Russia there'll be further support for Ukraine through sanctions if they do take this kind of action. But we've got to focus on finding a diplomatic outcome. That's the best outcome but for that's Ukraine not worked, and for the international community. That certainly hasn't worked so far. And this has been going on for some months now. The build-up of troops on those borders. Now more than 130,000 are there and the numbers have been growing. Have you seen any intelligence that does suggest that Russia will invade Ukraine this week? Well, you'd appreciate I'm not going to go into intelligence uh, findings. It's not just, just not appropriate to do. I would argue actually quite the opposite. We've, we've been fearful of what this means, the, the amassing of troops around and moving towards the border for some weeks. Absolutely right. Uh, the fact that Russia hasn't engaged could well be because those diplomatic um, engagements are working and Russia is seeing that there is a united international alliance against them in, encroaching into Ukraine. We've got to keep up that work keep up that clear pressure across the entire alliance uh, that we're not going to see to tolerate that kind of behavior from but Russia. You, but we've got to be cognizant of the risks. There. Do you agree though with the, with the Americans? We were talking to um, the advisor for the Secretary of State earlier on who, who was saying you know they think it could be imminent, it could be within days an attack. Well the point that the US are making quite rightly is where they've got that kind of amassing of troops, 130,000 odd troops, they have the ability to now move very very quickly and yes the reality is with that kind of pressure there it's not an intelligence uh, report matter. It's just a simple matter of fact. When you look at aerial images and you see that kind of number of troops, it is very clear that if the Russia does decide that they want to move and they want to go and invade Ukraine, they could do so very, very quickly. And we need to be very open about and that. And quickly, by quickly, you mean in the next couple of days, this week? Well, it is technically possible. That kind of number of troops, that amassing of um, their, their arsenal around that area on the, the border with, with 130,000 or troops, if they decide they want to move in, they can move in very, very quickly, yes. And that's what, well, why we're saying to UK citizens, the US and other countries, to their citizens, that they should be seeking to leave Ukraine. Because although we don't want to see that outcome, we hope Russia is true to its word about not wanting to invade. We also have to be practical and realistic about the threat that, there, that is there. What about the, the British citizens who are in Ukraine? They have been told to leave. Can you get them out in time? Well, we are uh, advising people to leave. Our embassy and the team there are working with British citizens. They're still there. They're focused on the ground in the brilliant way that our diplomats do um, and are doing in Kiev at the moment. Uh, we are encouraging people to leave and, and it is possible for people to leave and we'll continue to support them and work with them on that. If people get left behind, is there anything that you can do? Well, we're not at that stage yet. This is a different situation to that which we saw in Afghanistan, not least of all because of the <laughs> Um, abilities and the uh, weaponry and, and the measures that Russia have compared to what the Taliban had. So we've got to be practical and that's why it's right that we're saying to uh, UK citizens who are there at the moment that there is a risk, there is a threat that we are seeing amassing on the border and therefore the safest thing to do is to leave now and citizens should be leaving Ukraine. Is there a danger that the West is talking itself into a crisis? You look at uh, the comments from the Ukrainian president, President Zelensky, who says he wants to see evidence that the, an invasion is imminent. Well, what we're doing is just being very realistic. When you've got 130,000 troops on the border and continuing to move troops into that space, we've got to be, as I say, pragmatic and realistic about what the threat is. But at the same time, it's also right that we are using all the diplomatic means we can to, to de-escalate this across NATO, across all, all the alliance countries, uh, to work with Russia to find a way through that is a peaceful outcome, and that's what we want to see. Let's talk about Northern Ireland. You are, of course, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. On the 3rd of February, a few weeks ago, the DUP pulled the First Minister out of Stormont. There's no functioning executive there. How many days have you actually spent in Northern Ireland since then trying to sort things out? Uh, well, first of all, can I just correct that? <clears throat> That's not actually correct. The executive still is there. Uh, we actually changed the law. One of the things we did is, I saw earlier today, actually, the Labour Party were involved in this debate, it's, voted on it, but then it's seemed still to misunderstand. There, it's not functioning. It well, can't no, no, take decisions. No, it can't no, make not, decisions. No, let, let me, let, I think it's important to be clear about It's not quite true. And this is one of the things that's a bit interesting. It's my shadow uh, member, I think, earlier today was making this point. We passed legislation just last week, and Labour voted on this and supported it, to ensure the stability is there. So the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister aren't there. So they can't make decisions around cross-cutting issues, big new issues, but... All of the legislation that has already got to a certain point Absolutely, will continue, and it's important. I, no, that it I does understand do that. that. But the, you know, the issue for people who are in Northern Ireland, for example, the 350,000 people who are in hospital waiting list, one in five 
of the population there. Decisions need to be taken, and at the moment they cannot be taken. How much time well, have no, you actually been... So again, they, those, time, what so I want no, to establish no, is it, how much time you've been there so, to try and yeah, sort no, well, this I'm, out. I'm in Northern Ireland pretty much every week. But have you been uh, there since I, this I haven't happened? been there last week because I was in the United States talking about Northern Ireland, investments in Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, but I will be there in the next few days, uh, as I am pretty much every week. Uh, but let me be very clear as well. The Health Department, the Health Ministry is still in place, can continue to take most decisions. Not all, I accept. Uh, but there are decisions they can make. One of the big issues for the Northern Ireland Executive that they've not dealt with over many years is the health service and the reforms they need to improve the health service. We want to work with them and support them on that, but it's one of the challenges we have got in terms of the Stormont executive has not been able to come together and, and put those kind of reforms in place. Now, they have been challenged, obviously, with COVID, but it is the kind of reason why we need to see that. And the DUP function. says they will come back to the table if you get rid of the trade board in the Irish Sea or if you trigger Article 16. Which one are you going to do? Well, our focus is on coming to a conclusion, a positive, agreed conclusion with the EU. The, uh, Liz Truss, the Foreign Secretary, was in conversations with Mao Shevkovich uh, on Friday. Uh, I've met with Mao and, and the Foreign Secretary on these issues. We're meeting again next week. The teams are in detailed negotiations ahead of a, uh, a joint meeting in the week of the 21st of February. Look, we think there is a landing ground. We think there is a way of resolving this. The best way to resolve it is by agreement, because that gives certainty uh, and stability for businesses and people in Northern Ireland. But it is right, and one of the points DUP make, to be fair, so does Sinn Féin. We need to resolve the problems with the protocol to ensure that people in Northern Ireland can access goods and products in the way they always have done. Let me ask you about the ongoing, ongoing uh, inquiry into the parties in Downing Street in government. Have you received one of these police questionnaires? Uh, no, no, I haven't. The police have sent out more than 50, uh, apart from the Prime Minister. Do you know anyone who's got one? No, I don't, actually. Will you keep working for the Prime Minister if he is found to have broken the laws that he wrote? Well, look, let me answer that in two parts. First of all, I'm not going to get drawn into hypotheticals about a situation that hasn't happened, may possibly, perhaps, but probably possibly not. What I will say is my, I, I have a pretty uh, simplistic, if, like, if not an old-fashioned view about this. If you ask by the Prime Minister of your country to serve, you serve. And I'm very honoured and I'm lucky to be able to serve, not just my constituents in Great Yarmouth, but the UK, and particularly, obviously, in this role, the people of Northern Ireland. That's where my focus is. I have to say I give 100% loyalty to the Prime Minister because I know he is focused on those issues that matter to people across the United Kingdom. And I've said this before. So I actually think this is a Prime Minister who will go on and will fight successfully the next general election. So if it turns out that he has broken the law, and I know you're going to say it's hypothetical, but I'm asking you in principle, if the Prime Minister who wrote the rules and then we don't know yet whether he has or not, but if he is found to have broken the rules that he wrote, can you continue working for him in principle? Well, as, as you say, it's not, it's not a matter of proof. That is a well, hypothetical question. Uh, we've but got it, to it let, must be your no, principle. No, no uh, we've got to let the police finish their investigation. The Prime Minister will, as he said, he will respond to the questionnaire he's been sent. As I say, I'm confident that we will have our Prime Minister in place, delivering for people across the country, making the decisions, as he has done, getting them right around COVID, as well as the issues around leaving the European Union, taking our country forward in a positive way. And I look forward to continuing to serve you, him in that regard, as long as he wants me to. Your, your colleague Nadine Dorries, the Culture Secretary, says she won't withdraw her support from the Prime Minister if he gets a fixed penalty notice. But if he went out and kicked a dog, she'd probably withdraw her support from him. Do you agree? Uh, well, look, Nadine has a, a wonderful turn of language that's uh, unique to Nadine. We all argue things in our own, uh, in our own ways. And look, my point is, and it has always been, I'm very honoured to serve. I've served three Prime Ministers. I'm as honoured to serve this one as I am any other, both for the people of the United Kingdom and particularly within that, obviously Northern Ireland. I will continue to do that. And I have absolute confidence in our Prime Minister to deliver for the country. He's the right man for the job and he has my full support. So your loyalty, loyalty to the Prime Minister will go ahead of whether or not he has broken the law? My loyalty goes to the Prime Minister and the people of the United Kingdom. Let's take one last look at the, the story that is dominating today because uh, everything is moving so quickly with Russia and Ukraine. Do you think that this time next week we could be sitting here and uh, asking how we stood by while President Putin was allowed to invade Ukraine? Well, I hope not. Um, I hope we're not in that position. But we are actually taking a lot of action. Not only have we had, as I say, the Foreign Secretary and the Defence Secretary in Russia just this week, obviously the Prime Minister has been leading the way, working with our allies around the world to have a cohesive, united approach uh, against the Russian uh, aggression that we're seeing. And we all want to see a peaceful outcome. But we have also been, as a country, we should be very proud of the support we have given to Ukraine, that they themselves have highlighted the support of the Prime Minister and the UK more generally over a number of years to make sure that Ukraine has the strength to be able to defend itself. But we've got to be very clear, there is a threat from Russia that we need to see de-escalated. Brandon Lewis, thank you very much. You. And that is it from us for this morning. See you again next week. Goodbye. <laughs>